I think the biggest risk to the American economy is Trump in the White House, an inexperienced crew at Treasury, and a willingness for the White House to mess with important American economic institutions. It's been now quite some time since the 2008 recession. So the US economy now has been growing for 10, 11 years. It's a very long expansion. We've seen recently, if you just look at the popular press, a bubble, I would say, in discussion about recessions. Everyone wants to talk about it. Is there one just around the corner? The fact that, that the expansion has lasted so long has no predictive power whatsoever for whether a recession will start tomorrow. So recessions don't die of old age, they're murdered. Through much of our history, um, particularly we saw this in 1980, 81, the Federal Reserve that would try and choke off an expansion and maybe do so a little too vigorously. I'm of the view that the Fed seems to understand how difficult this act is and they're being very, very cautious about things. So I'm not so worried about the Fed. There are sometimes external shocks, things like a sharp rise in oil prices, um, a productivity slowdown. Of course, any of those things could happen, but those things are no more likely in 2019 than they were in 2018 or 2017 or 2016, or than they will be in 2020. They're an ever-present risk. So all of that makes me um, something of an optimist. Now, of course, the other thing you've got to think about is we're in a particular historic moment, and it's hard not to think about the state of our politics um, and whether we have the A-team in the White House right now. And I'm not someone who sleeps easy at night believing that if something went wrong, the White House would figure out how to make it right. I'm, I'm very worried that a small adverse shock could turn into something more calamitous with policy mistakes coming out of the White House. What is that policy mistake? I gotta tell you, I don't know what it is. It could be something on trade that, you know, with enough mischief and cutting off enough trading relationships with enough trading partners, you could really start to harm US growth. We have negotiations going on with numerous countries right now to pay a lot of money to the United States for what we're doing for them. I wouldn't say they're thrilled, because they've had many, many years where they didn't have to pay. So now they're gonna to have to pay. The question is, if something bad happens, are they gonna have the right instincts? I think the biggest risk to the American economy is Trump in the White House, an inexperienced crew at Treasury, and a willingness for the White House to mess with important American economic institutions. What he's doing with the Fed is a, is a disgrace, it's a risk, it's causing all sorts of strife that's unnecessary and it's an own goal. Um, so we see meddling in important parts of American policy in a way that we've never seen in our history. So the US debt is not currently at a level that particularly worries me. What does worry me somewhat is the trajectory for that debt. Um, we're at a point now where unemployment is about, is below 4%. The basic rule of thumb that we teach our undergraduates in school is, when the economy is good, put a bit of money away so that when things go south, you can come out, spend a little more and stimulate the economy so it's going to do a little better. You know, when unemployment's below 4%, it's got to be the case that now's the time to be putting a little bit away. Instead, what we're seeing is large budget deficits that are raising the debt substantially. That doesn't worry me of itself, but what worries me is, if the next downturn hits, will we be in a position to expand spending? Will we be in a position to raise the debt as would be required if we're in the midst of a downturn. Now let me temper all of that with a note of optimism. The single best way of figuring out where the economy is going next year is to figure out where it is right now and where it's currently going. GDP growth is robust, recent jobs numbers have all been very strong, and if that's the best indicator for the future, it says the economy's been on a straight line, improving year after year from 2009 to the present. And if it keeps on that straight line, all of our lives will get a little bit better again next year as they have for each of the last 10 years. And if you want proof of that, take a look at my own home country, Australia. Uh, people have been looking at its economic expansion ever since it began 27 years ago. And I gotta tell you, after five years, people worried it was about to turn south. After seven years, after nine years, after 11 years, it's not just the odd numbered years. We keep one wondering, can this expansion continue? And the fact that Australia can expand for 27 years in a row tells you that an American economy, if it's well run, if it's not subject to outside shocks, could easily continue expanding um, a whole lot further. There are many good reasons to care about GDP, but there's a lot of other things that real human beings, not just economists, also care about. Um, the first is to think about inequality. GDP tells us how big the size of the pie is. It doesn't tell us whether people are getting fair slices. So we should care about the distribution of income, not just how much of it there is. GDP only tells us how much of it there is. When you think about things that might shape your quality of life, it might be um, 
a lot more things. You might care about, you know, the level of crime is a really important factor. Um, your freedom to pursue what you care about, whether you feel respected, whether you feel loved. Um, there's a whole lot of other things that are central to the human experience, but outside of the stuff that GDP has historically measured. We could double GDP tomorrow, it wouldn't be that hard. What we'd do is we'd force everyone to stay at work twice as long. Force everyone to work twice as many hours, we'll probably get roughly, maybe a little bit less, but nearly twice as much stuff. GDP would nearly double. But I reckon people would be miserable. Because think about what really made you happy this year. It wasn't the extra hour at work, it was probably the time you took off. It was your leisure time, it was the time you spent with family, the time you spent with friends and so on. It's not hard to find ways to make people richer. Just make them work harder. It's much harder to find ways to make people more satisfied, and the way to do that is, is make them more productive, give them more options, give them more opportunities. It's not necessarily that money is what makes you happy. Maybe money is a marker for something deeper, that this process of economic development gives people more choices, more freedoms uh, to pursue the things that really matter. So it's possible that it's not the GDP itself that matters. It's the process of economic development gives us choices that people then use to make decisions that give them the other stuff we care about, that give them the meaning, the joy, the love, the freedom from hunger, the freedom from want. So, you know, the flaws with GDP are actually quite well documented. We understand them. The GDP focuses on what happens in the market. It doesn't pay enough attention to distributional consequences. It doesn't pay attention to what we do after hours. So one of the things that the statistical agencies around the world are doing, including our own Bureau of Economic Analysis in the United States, is finding ways to improve GDP. So at the moment, any hours of housework you do, uh, if you do them in your own family home, they don't count as adding to GDP. But if you go to someone else's home and they pay you $12 an hour to do that housework, that does count as GDP. So why don't we instead find ways of taking all the domestic work that people do and adding it up and counting that as part of our gross domestic output. So that's something we can do. We can pay attention to who gets what. And so right now there's concern about what we call distributional accounts. If we take GDP, we don't just measure the size of the pie. We say who's getting what, what slices. We can also think about the environmental parts. So one of the big problems about GDP is it doesn't measure the environmental damage that we're doing. GDP tells us about the value of all goods and services bought and sold in markets. But a lot of really important stuff doesn't happen in markets. Greenhouse gases are being expelled and destroying the environment. So that damage, those costs, real costs to our planet, are not being counted as part of GDP. Now, when we have an old factory and we use it too hard and the machinery depreciates, we do count that. So we could do the same thing, it's not beyond us, and measure the environmental harms that we're doing as well. So if I were asked to give advice to a country given what I know, which is that rich countries tend to have citizens that report having lived happier, more meaningful lives. How would I give them advice? I would tell them, do a bunch of the things that our developed countries, like the United States, like Sweden, like Finland, do a bunch of those things. So it's not just go and be richer, right? Those countries also have more democracy, they have a freer press, they have less crime, they have a better environment and so on. So this whole package of economic development, which changes many, many things about both society and the human condition. The one thing we know is that whole package of, hum of, of economic development somehow leads to happier, more satisfied people.